Right. So um, this is a modified talk that I sometimes give to uh, high school students and uh, most recently to elementary school students um, around Remembrance Day. And uh, it's something that uh, that um, it's 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 quite effective and it's it's uh, it's just very interesting to learn about our past in this way. Um, this image right here that we're seeing on the screen is uh, it's actually a painting. It's a painting of the Second Battle of Ypres, which was in 1915. Uh, this was the first big battle that Canadian troops took part in in the First World War. If you ever get a chance uh, to get down to the National War Museum in Ottawa, they have this on one of the one of the walls in the World War One uh, section, and uh, it's it's very very large. Um, the fellow in the middle who's pointing, in actual fact, is uh, is about eight feet tall in the actual painting, so it's quite it's quite big, and uh, it's certainly worth looking at. And what it is, it represents uh, not necessarily a single scene, even though it obviously is a single scene as a painting. It represents sort of the entire experience of the of the painter, of the artist, uh, during the Second Battle of Ypres, sort of, um, uh, you can see the clouds of poison gas, there's people who have been killed, there's people who have been wounded, there's fighting, there's sort of uh, heroism, people coming up to reinforce and, and all sorts of little vignettes across this scene. Um, this is something that I like to start with just because it, it really kind of sets the scene for, for sort of the life and deathness of, of what we're talking about. Um, the Second Battle of Ypres was the, the first large battle that Canadian troops took part in, uh, not just in the First World War, but indeed in, uh, really in, in, uh, in Canada's history. Um, certainly there was, there was smaller battles in Saskatchewan in 1885 with the Northwest Rebellion. And uh, indeed, there was Canadians in the the uh, the Boer War, but uh, but they pale in comparison uh, from a size standpoint to the Second Battle of Ypres in Belgium. Um, so there were Canadians and there were people from Kenora in the Second Battle of Ypres. You can see right in the middle of the photo, there's a fellow using a Colt machine gun. Uh, there's a fellow from Menaki named Duncan Robertson, who uh, we know from from a uh, uh, the uh, the uh, journal that uh, the Glen Iron put together. Um, uh, Duncan Robertson was manning a Colt machine gun during the Second Battle of Ypres, much like we see in the photo here, in the, the image here. And uh, a shell landed pretty much right at his feet and uh, Duncan Robertson ceased to exist. Uh, that was that. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. This is sort of the, the, uh, the seriousness of, uh, of, uh, of the fighting in the, in the First World War. So, um, before the Second Battle of Ypres, the, the recruiting in Kenora was, was kind of, was going fast and furious. There was a lot of uh, excitement, certainly. Uh, this was taken just after Christmas 1915. Uh, the reason why we know it's just after Christmas is because in, uh, on uh, Christmas Eve 1914, the steeple of the Notre Dame Catholic Church, and actually the whole church, uh, burned to the ground. You can see in the middle of the photo here, the square top on Notre Dame. Um, that's because there was quite a dreadful fire there on Christmas Eve. Um, but the, the fellows down here uh, marching on the harbor front, you can see the city hall obviously is in the background, and, uh, and um, the library is there as well. Um, the, the fellows marching on the harbor front, uh, there's not uniforms for them yet. And uh, they're, they're, they're just really kind of excited to be there. So this is a, the 94th Battalion. This is the local battalion that was raised up. Um, never actually fought as a unit. Um, they, they were from Kenora, Fort Francis, uh, Sioux Lookout slash Dryden, and Thunder Bay. And uh, once there was enough soldiers who were, who were enlisted, um, they, they went to Thunder Bay and then forward on to Quebec and then on to England. And then in England, they were broken up as replacements and, uh, and sent to pretty much every unit in the Canadian Corps. So uh, as a consequence, people from Kenora were, were represented right across the Canadian Corps. Okay, there we go. Oh. <clears throat> this is Harold Machen. You may recognize this guy. This is when he was quite a bit younger than when he was in the First World War. This is actually when, just after he returned from South Africa, uh, he was in law school in Toronto. He was at Osgoode Hall and uh, his unit was uh, was was uh, petitioned for volunteers, and uh, he he took uh, took the 
the king shilling, as they say, and went off to South Africa. Uh, you can see his nice upturned mustache there, quite a, quite a handsome young guy, a uh, young gentleman uh, and officer. By 1914, he was an MPP representing this area, and uh, he was not particularly interested in being involved in the First World War. He was quite happy to be a lawyer and, and, uh, and uh, be an MPP. And he was asked by uh, Colonel Sam Steele to, to lead the 94th Battalion, and he reluctantly admitted, uh, reluctantly uh, uh, said he would do it. Um, by his own admission, he was not in great shape. Uh, he called himself, uh, once referred to himself as a fat old soldier, and, uh, and was, uh, was not super keen, but again saw that, that uh, uh, his country was calling and, and uh, took up the mantle. Now, this is a fellow that is not from Kenora, but this is someone that people would probably find um, familiar, a uh, handsome fellow here. This is uh, John McRae. The name is probably familiar to you because he wrote in Flanders Fields, uh, probably the most fam famous poem about the First World War, and actually probably one of the most famous poems of all time. Uh, in Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, etc., etc. Um, so he actually wrote that poem just after the Second Battle of Ypres, which was the battle from the first image. Um, when he wrote the poem, he had been awake for about 10 days straight. He hadn't removed his boots for about the same amount of time. And he had just conducted the funeral of one of his best friends at uh, the field ambulance where he was stationed in Belgium. And sitting in the back of a field ambulance, he, he scrawled some lines on a, on a notebook which became in Flanders fields. He noticed the, the clay heavy soil of Flanders was really adept and the only thing that would grow were these little red poppies. And uh, he, he was quite, quite taken with that. It wasn't an immediate hit, um, but it was published in December 1915 and then it became fantastically successful. Um, he was not a, a, a fighting man, he was a doctor at this point. Um, he wanted to go as a gunner, but he was too old by the time the war had started, so he, he went as a, as a physician. And uh, they needed physicians more than they needed gunners, quite frankly. Um, but he was, he was quite a star. And by 1915, 16, 17, the idea of poppies and Flanders were quite, um, they were synonymous. And they were something that, that is the indelible sort of link uh, to the First World War. So what you see here before you, and what I will grab from my stand here, is this is actually from a book notes on trench warfare you can see right here notes on trench warfare that was owned by harold machen uh, the fellow with the mustache the mpp the self-described uh, fat old soldier who wasn't super keen on being involved did find his way to the front uh, not as the commander of the 94th but as a commander of a labor battalion and, uh, and he did find his way to the front, and he found his way to, to France in 1917. And as part of his uh, time at the front, he did take a souvenir, which is this poppy here. And I can actually show you, in actual fact, if you uh, want to come by the museum, I can certainly show you in person. Um, but this is, oh, there we go. Well. You'll have to take, uh, take my word for it on the video, but you can see the image directly in front of you. Um, a poppy from France, collected by Harold Machen. Oh, there we go. There we are. Collected by Harold Machen in 1917 uh, as a souvenir of his time in France and saved in his notes of, for infantry officers on trench warfare. Um, so souvenirs played a large part in how we remember the war, and they played a large part in in how soldiers would pass the time um before i get back to souvenirs one of the things that's really important as well that we talk about is it's it's very easy to think about the first world war as a men's war a men's fight um this is an image of ada ross ada ross was uh, she was born in rat portage and uh, grew up here before moving to winnipeg and she enlisted as a nurse nursing sister in uh, in the first world war and this is something that, that is, is not necessarily looked at as much, but is something that is just as important, certainly, and just as dangerous. Ada Ross was part of a group of nurses at a hospital that was actually shelled and eventually bombed by a German unit. 
and uh, and certainly uh, in more than once had to um, uh, kind of dodge enemy fire uh, while trying to conduct medical medical treatments on soldiers. Um, by 1917, she was uh, severely exhausted, both mentally and physically, and uh, she developed uh, severe pneumonia in, in 1917 and eventually passed away. And so we have certainly young men who are who are killed in the fight, and uh, I consider Ada Ross to have been killed in the fight as well. Uh, she gave everything she had, and uh, including her life, and uh, in the service of others. So certainly something that we we uh, we uh, would do well to remember in uh, the Remembrance Day kind of season. Uh, one of the ways that, that soldiers spent their time uh, was uh, was dodging shells, much like this one. <laughs> uh, this is a German gun, actually. So this is one that would have been shooting at Canadian soldiers. And the reason why I have this is, let's go back over to my over to my cart here. And oof, oh, oh, this is heavy. Okay, so this is a 21 centimeter Morser field gun shell, which is the kind of shell that was fired by this gun that you see right ahead of you, right in front of you. Um, it could fire a shell that weighed 250 pounds, 12 kilometers. And so that's like taking me and flinging me from where the museum is to the other side of Kuwait. Uh, so it can certainly do a lot of damage. It can certainly, certainly move a lot of metal. And so in the First World War, soldiers spent a lot of time dug underground. They spent a lot of time just kind of sitting around, not actually really doing anything, kind of not, not fighting or shooting at anything, hiding from stuff like this. And the amount of shells, uh, it was a huge amount of shells. There was a, a, a fantastic amount of explosives flying around. And this just kind of goes to show you, this is an image that I, I took in uh, 2017 in France, just outside of uh, Corselet on the Somme. And they're still digging shells out of their out of their fields, out of their their farmers' fields. You can see this little kind of yellow lollipop-looking thing. Uh, farmers have those strapped to the sides of their tractors, and when they find shells that have come up out of the ground from the frost, uh, from the frost heave, they take one of those little lollipops, they stick it in the ground, and uh, 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 French army troops will come by and they'll collect up the shells and uh, they'll dispose of them. So. Uh, a lot, a lot of what we would consider in 2021 as sort of war junk, a lot of stuff that's kind of around. And as a consequence, they were underground, they were hiding from the shells, they were trying to stay safe. And one of the things that they spent their time doing was creating great artwork, trench art, out of the very things that were causing them to have to flee underground. So they, uh, it was very possible to be a Canadian soldier in uh, the First World War and only be involved in one or two or three large battles in several years. Um, and so there was a lot of time sitting and there was a lot of time doing this trench art, which I have an example of trench art right here. This is one actually that was donated to the museum as a vase back in the 80s. Uh, the person was like, this is a very interesting vase. And when I arrived in 2011, that mostly held flowers. It still does from time to time. Um, but uh, I noticed it and I turned it over and I said, aha, this is actually a French 75 millimeter gun uh, shell. And uh, it is a perfect piece of trench art. It's an example of trench art made from an artillery shell, clearly by a soldier who uh, was trying to do some uh, positive intellectual stimulation and, and uh, really was probably just quite quite bored as well. And uh, was quite an artist, was, uh, was quite, uh, quite adept at art. So something that's important to remember as well um, it wasn't 24 seven rah, rah kind of fighting. There was a lot of time to sit around to develop, um, slang and lingo and a whole soldier's culture that was then, uh, transported back to Canada in, uh, in 1919. So an example here, another example of a souvenir that was brought back. This is, uh, this is Sidney Wilcox. Sidney Wilcox was an engineer, uh, uh, railway engineer, a civil engineer. He built bridges. He didn't drive the trains. He was a, a bridge builder and a roadmaster. And one of the things that, that a number of troops from Kenora did was they went and operated the short gauge railways in France and Belgium. So they needed railway officers. They needed railway troops. They needed people who knew how to work the railways. And that's something that Kenora had a lot of. And so they were given a very brief sort of uh, two-week class on how to 
how to salute and how to wear a uniform and these sorts of things. And they were taken from the CPR yards and the CN yards here and sent to France and Belgium, where they could serve their country over there as well. And, uh, and Sid Wilcox, with his two kids here, little Charlie and Gertrude, um, uh, I'm not sure if this will, I, I suspect this will work, but let's find out. I've got a video of, of, of uh, a dramatic reading of one of the letters he sent home to young Gertrude. And, uh, and let's see if that's going to work for us. So a very good example there, uh, not just of, of uh, sort of souvenirs sent home, but an example of, uh, you know, these are real people who had real families and real loved ones and, and took time out of their lives to, to uh, not just time, took several years out of their lives in some cases, uh, to be involved in this, in this, uh, in, in, in the fight, in the fight for, uh, uh, um, their country. So we mentioned a pair of rings, and I've got a close up there, and I think that's that's probably an easier way to see these because I've got the actual rings right here, um, but it's they're a little bit difficult to see. So I've got a close up here of the actual rings that Sid Wilcox sent home to uh, Gertrude and Charlie, and uh, there is one that's inscribed Aras, and one that's inscribed Vimy, as you can see. And uh, there are these little iron rings, and uh, and they these would have been put together specifically uh, for souvenirs to send home to kids, uh, put together by French civilians as a as a way to kind of help restart their economy uh, during the war. So interesting examples of other souvenirs. So this is one that um, that is is something that that we maybe don't think enough about in in the context of the 20th century. Um, but something that is absolutely fascinating. Um, so this is Frank Cromwell. Frank Cromwell was from Kuwaitan, and he grew up in Kuwaitan and enlisted uh, here in Kenora over on Matheson Street and uh, found his way over to France where he was a gunner. He was a, an artilleryman. Uh, you can see here he's, he's posing uh, with, the, with the gunner's flash on his, on his hat. Um, this is the actual hat that he's wearing in this photo right here. Uh, you can see that. Uh, the the flash on the front is uh, is the uh, Ubik, the uh, artillery uh, crest, the one they still use today for my friends up at the armory. And uh, Frank Cromwell was involved in the Battle of Passchendaele, which was actually in November in in 1917, where he was injured. And he actually, what happened was he was carrying a shell and he dropped it on his foot. He broke his foot. And uh, there was a bit of an investigation, you know, maybe they thought he did it on purpose, but it turned out he was, he was okay. He didn't harm himself on purpose. But when he was in the hospital, they came into the hospital and they asked for volunteers for a new duty. They were looking for gunners uh, for a new duty that wasn't in France or Belgium. It wasn't on the Western Front. Well, Frank thought that sounded pretty good. Uh, not going to the Western Front, that sounded just dandy. Well, what he didn't realize was in 1917, there was a revolution occurring in Russia. And the Russians were allies of the British, French, and, and, uh, and Canadians. And there was an insurgency in their country called the Bolsheviks, the Red Army, were trying to take out the uh, soldiers of the Tsar, the White Army. So the Red Army was fighting the White Army, and the British, French, Americans, and others were, and Canadians certainly, were going to send troops to Russia to fight the Bolsheviks, to fight the Red Army. That was Frank. Uh, he was part of this group. Um, just an amazing story. They loaded up uh, before the end of the fighting on the Western Front, and they were involved in active combat operations in northern Russia until May 1919. So they were using their guns, their artillery pieces, to, to uh, support white Russian troops and in some cases, the Bolsheviks, the Red Army, were actually almost overrunning their positions, and they would take up the fight with, uh, defend their positions with rifles and bayonets and bombs and, uh, and, and, and all the accoutrements you would expect. Um, I actually have as well, and I hope everyone can see these. Um, and if not, certainly you can come by the museum. This is the uniform that Frank was wearing in that uh, image right here. And this very unique shoulder flash, the blue with the white star, is representative of the 16th Brigade, which was a uh, artillery unit that Frank was part of, and was one of the smallest and most unique units of the war going to northern Russia to fight 
And uh, this is one of the most uh, rare examples of First World War uniforms in Canadian military. Um, I've got a friend who's a big uh, collector, and uh, he was he was uh, blown away that we have that. So we're pretty pretty lucky to have that very interesting piece of Canadian history. But as I said, 67th Battalion, 16th Brigade didn't hand over their guns outside of Kurgomen, which is kind of close to Archangel, uh, in northern Russia, until May 28, 1919. Um, so this has big implications, certainly, for the rest of the 20th century. And by the 1930s, when Canadian and British and American foreign policy agents are very concerned that the Red Army and the, the USSR is not interested in working with them, and indeed are more interested in working with the Germans than working with the, the Americans, British, or, or Canadians. Um, this is why. Because they actually said, we don't want to work with you because you sent troops to fight us only about 15 years ago. And that's where the, the sort of the, uh, the nexus of the alliance between the Germans and the Russians that eventually did fall apart, thankfully. Um, but that's where the nexus of that connection was because uh, in support of the white army, um, uh, Canadians, British, uh, were, were, were joining in the fight. So very interesting piece of world history that is from right here in town. And Frank ended up did coming back. Uh, he was, he was, uh, did come back in the summer of 1919, moved back to Kuwaitin. Uh, uh, Betsy, he married, uh, Betsy Naniska, uh, prior to the war and, uh, they, they lived in Kuwaitin. So, as I mentioned, it is Indigenous uh, Veterans Day on November 8th, which is today. And uh, you may have seen in the past two years, two and a half years, that our armory here in town is no longer just the Kenora Armory. It is now the Private David Kijik DCM Armory. Uh, well, this is an image of Private David Kijik. He's on the, uh, on the left here. Seated is Moses Land. Uh, Moses Land was from Grassy Narrows, and they were both in the 52nd Battalion CEF, uh, Canadian Expeditionary Force, which was the unit from Thunder Bay. And the 52nd was uh, actually, um, if you go back to 1917 in December, uh, they were fighting outside of Passchendaele, and that's where Moses Land was actually killed. And unfortunately, Moses Land, uh, his body was never recovered, and his name is inscribed on the Vimy Ridge Memorial. David Kijik, the next year in October, was awarded. He didn't win it. Uh, he was awarded for, for his conduct, uh, the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which was the second uh, only to the Victoria Cross as far as medals for valor in the First World War. Uh, by taking out a machine gun post, pretty much by himself, uh, it was pinning his unit down, and, and he grabbed the, the unit Lewis gun and approached it himself and uh, ended up taking about 60 prisoners, including an officer. And uh, the rest of his unit said it was basically the most impressive thing they'd ever seen. So uh, he took all those prisoners. He was awarded for conduct, the Distinguished Conduct Medal. And um, after the First World War, returned to this area, returned to Shoal Lake, where he was the chief for many years and, and showed uh, leadership in the community as well. And uh, that is why uh, the, the renaming of the armory uh, took place. Uh, he is the highest awarded soldier from this area, um, but also showed tremendous leadership during the war and afterwards as well. So I think we're quite, uh, we're quite proud of our, of our, uh, of our Private David Kijik Armory and uh, quite proud of the memory of Private David Kijik, uh, a great local member. And uh, just wrapping up here, um, just something that, that is uh, it's something that's quite quite important and something that is is quite tangible as well. The the Kenora Cenotaph was built originally in 1924, and this is actually an image from the opening. You can see there's the three members of the clergy to the side there. I think there's the Anglican, the the uh, the Catholics, and the um, uh, Methodists. I suspect maybe the Presbyterians. Um, but in any case, they uh, were there. They were opening up the the park. That White House is where the museum currently is. Um, we actually have the front door of that house down in, in our basement, um, in our storage area. But the reason why cenotaphs were built in Kenora and around the world, around the country, I should say, rather, um, is because there was a, a fear that just after the war, only people who either had money 
or were part of organizations like the Odd Fellows or the Masons or these sorts of things, or had some sort of connection would would be remembered in, in this way. And throughout the early 1920s, there was a huge push across Canada to build public cenotaphs where every single person from a community who was killed during the war or shortly thereafter due to the war um, could be remembered and could be remembered equally, not officers over here and soldiers over here or not rich people over here or poor people over here, everyone equally in alphabetical order. Um, their sacrifice was equal and so that they would be displayed equally as well. And so that's what we have here in Kenora. Um, a second plaque was added after the Second World War. And again, it's a tangible example of something that when you're walking past the museum to the courthouse or, or, uh, or just kind of through the park, something that you can look to and, uh, and be reminded, uh, not just on Remembrance Day, but, but every day of the year.